Welcome to the Tyrannocene Period. The Tyrannocene Period is the time period that follows the Mutavolocene, lasting from 41 million years to 80 million years following the planet's colonization. The Tyrannocene is notable for the evolution of the first fully air-breathing sharks, capable of leaving their aquatic past for a more terrestrial existence. The Tyrannocene Period is a direct analog to the Devonian of Earth as both involve fish starting to involve adaptations for prolonged life on land. This is how the continents have looked throughout the Tarina Sea. Sea levels started to rise around this time. Kanmapu has started to drift towards North Lyrusa to the extent that the two land masses are almost touching one another. One major innovation the Salachipotiform sharks developed was a form of primitive lung that functioned alongside the gills and respiration. This organ consists of a pair of sacs in which oxygen-rich air is inhaled, aided by nasal passages that evolved to breathe in air through the nostrils while the mouth is submerged. As these sharks become increasingly terrestrial, the gills may take an increasingly less significant role in respiration and atrophy altogether in obligate land dwellers. This little diagram is, depicts the lungs on a Salachipotiform shark, pardon me if it's a little crude. Salachipotiforms, having first developed in the Mutavolocene, have seen greater success in the Tyrannocene. The species Perambulopherox has undergone several key adaptations for limited terrestrial behavior. It can remain on the shore for several hours before being submerged, which would be more than enough time to migrate to new territory in the event of water stagnation. The extended time P. Ferox spent on land can be attributed to its ability to breathe out of the water. Perambulopherox grew within size ranges comparable to those of a largemouth bass, with the largest individuals being a little over two feet in length. Its highest recorded weight is around 20 kilograms, slightly lighter than a bass would be due to its carnalagin skeleton, which is lighter than bone. A descendant of Corambula ferox, Terracarcaria ionis was the first shark that could live its entire adult life without needing to breathe underwater, forming the clay known as the Salachipods. Basal Salachipods, such as T. ionis, had developed their muscular fins that are walking limbs analogous to those of tetrapods crawling with the gait not unlike a salamander. Their cartilaginous skeletons were reinforced by calcium for added structural support. Part of the typo. Terracarcaria ionis was about 6 feet long with a snout to tail, very bit larger than the early stem tetrapod Ichthyostega on Earth. This difference in size can be attributed to both the lower gravity of Spalmosia and its lighter skeleton, although it should be noted that Salachipods also grew as well such large sizes because of their efficient breathing mechanisms. One of the defining characteristics of Terracarcaria pianus and Salachipods in general is the development of a functional ear canal. While sharks on Earth don't have ears in any shape or form, the spiracles on the back of the head, originally used to aid in respiration, may be repurposed into a hearing mechanism now that breathing can be done through the nostrils. Across the Papalaya moths remain the dominant diurnal predators on land, where their success caused many species to maintain the basic traditionally moth-like body plan of their ancestors. The tigrine grazer with moth, named for its striped body, was one such species, capable of feeding not only on smaller arthropods, but also any young slatchipods it was lucky to happen upon. This razor whip moth is well adapted for human environments due to its waterproof scales. As an adult, the tigrine razor whip moth maxes out at 7 inches in length, or about as long as a Montezuma quail. Larvae are 5 centimeters long when they first hatch, tripling in size when preparing to metamorphose. Invertebrates in general around this time tend to get quite big, due to both increased oxygen levels and a relative lack of competition from salachipods. While many razor whip species remain similar to Mutavolocene stock, some species began to optimize for other modes of hunting. Dimorphopus perperonts had wings too small for flight but compensating with powerful back legs resembling those of crickets, grasshoppers, or katydids. These saltatorial legs allow the moth to pounce at prey with lethal precision. The genus Dimorphopus is named not only for its specialized legs, but also because it displays sexual dimorphism, as can be seen here. Dimorphopus purpurans usually grows up to an adult size of 6 inches in length, or about the size of a small American bullfrog. It hatches a half-inch long caterpillar, and its final instar before metamorphosing into an adult is slightly shorter, about 5 inches in total body length. Other razor whip moths diversified in different ways. One subfamily, the Papalophones, became neonidic, spending their entire lives in the caterpillar stage. 
while early papilophytes were identical to the larvae of basal razorwood moths, later species, like the common silk snake, no relation to actual snakes, lost their legs and pro-legs for a slithering locomotion. The insect hunted like a boa constrictor, trapping prey in its body and finishing it off with a deadly bite from its sharpened mandibles. The common silk snake was fairly large for a moth to its lightlessness, maxing out about 16 inches in length, or about as long as a grown man's forearm. This made one of the largest arthropods of the terrain scene. The insect's nymphs, for want of a better term, were about a quarter of an inch when they first hatched. Spiders at the time also began to display some degree of adversity. One of the more ubiquitous species was the bristle sole, a semi aquatic tarantula whose small size and flattened, bristle adorned feet allow it to walk on water, similar to water spiders on Earth. The bristle sole can do this in the properties of surface tension, which allows the spider to distribute its weight such that it doesn't sink. It uses its ability to hunt other arthropods on the surface of the water. Bristle sole spiders had to be small in order to properly exploit the high surface tension of water. So they only got as big as an Asian giant hornet, or a little over two inches. Although the size might be might seem too large for an animal to walk on the water surface, keep in mind that smallest gravity is lower than Earth's, and thus more force will be required for the spider to break the water surface. Although I'm not exactly a physics expert. With the extinction of many large gastropod species on land, isopods were poised to take their place as large diurnal grazers. This species, Spyostropus robustus, as well as a toughened carapace of orange with spikes similar to the bony armor of these things at chiosaurs. With such fierce predators as spiders and razorwood moths prowling about, one can see why the crustacean took such measures to protect itself. This individual can be seen feeding among the lush greenery. Due to how effective its defenses were, Spinotrochus robustus was free to grow to sizes that would be rare even among the abundance of already large arthropods. At full size, the isometric arrival of a miniature donkey in life growing up to 43 inches from cephalothorax of Pleon. Although their numbers had a steep decline, large land snails didn't go completely extinct. Some, like Bruce's Snowder, shout out to Wesley Bruce, adapted to become nocturnal, using their shells as camouflage to avoid being hunted by predators during the day. To the casual observer, the moss shell would appear to be nothing more than an innocuous boulder. Its slow metabolism allowed to last the day without feeding, with the added effect of allowing small plants to grow on its shell, thus reinforcing its disguise. The shell of Bruce's snorter could reach up to a foot in diameter on average, although exceptionally old individuals have been reported with shells measuring two feet in diameter. Baby snorters have shells more similar to size to pebbles, starting out at two inches before becoming larger as they mature. Plants in the terrain have continued the trend of growing taller in height as time goes on, eventually becoming proper trees. They expanded and raised to form sparse ranges of forests that would grow into the millions of years to come. With the exception of kiwi and most grasses, nearly all plant species will evolve into a tree of some kind. Kiwi plants are less likely to evolve into a tree to extend as epiphytes, or plants that grow on other plants while not being parasitic, and grasses do competition from taller crops like pepper or dragon fruit. Aquatic ecosystems are largely unchanged from what they were like in the Mutant Holocene, aside from an increase in new hemicillion diversity. The Salachopods were able to claim large predatory niches around the water, but in their infancy they are a minority compared to the menagerie of large invertebrates that already had time to make the land their own. While razorwood moths and spiders constitute much of the local predator fauna on land, many are still prey to fully grown Salachopods, meaning that their reign may very well be under threat from these newcomers. Isopods are some of the dominant diurnal herbivores near their heavy armor, while the large gastropods are making a comeback under the cover of darkness. Remember, this video doesn't cover everything about the Terrena scene, only the aspects and creatures most important of plant's history. If you don't understand what I just showed you all, you can always access the Google Doc or the Sporecast for the project for more detailed information. The links are posted in the description. If you have any questions pertaining to the project, I'll gladly answer them to the best of my ability in the comments section. On the next episode, we'll explore the Spinosocene period, in which the Salachopods are traversing the changing landscape, or in some regions are dominated by lush Pattaya forests.